I'm Jeff Glore, co-host of CBS This Morning Saturday. From Antarctica to the UK, we're taking a journey across the globe to highlight some of the environmental issues our world is facing. We begin stateside, where trillions of small plastic pellets known as nurdles have been escaping from petrochemical plants into waterways and oceans for decades. I spoke with a fourth generation fisherwoman and environmental activist in Texas who fought one of the largest plastic manufacturers in the world. While there was a monumental settlement, the problem is not shrinking. Picking up a shovel full of pellets, and this is Cox's Creek. Take a trip up Cox Creek off the Gulf of Mexico, and it's impossible to miss this gigantic petrochemical factory. That's a massive plant. What's sometimes harder to see is what's finding its way out of it. Countless plastic pellets, sometimes called nurdles. How many pellets are going into the water on a daily basis? They managed to scoop up 79 billion in uh, two years. Diane Wilson is a fourth generation fisherwoman who used to captain a shrimp boat. This is the polyethylene powder that's all over the bay. She is now an environmental activist fighting one of the largest plastics manufacturers in the world. This was never the plan to go from a fisherwoman to an environmental <laughs> activist. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, people don't believe it, but I am normally very quiet. I'm an introvert. So why this? Because it fell flat in my lap. The Taiwanese conglomerate Formosa Plastics first opened this factory in 1983. It now covers 2,500 acres of land near Port Lavaca, Texas. Trillions of polyethylene plastic pellets like these are made here. The first step in making products that we use every day, from plastic bottles to bags, clothing and electronics. But billions of plastic pellets are also lost and find their way into waterways and eventually oceans. Many wash back up onto the beach. So this is thousands and thousands of nurdles, all from the most recent high tide line. Jace Tunnel is the founder of the Nurdle Patrol, which began tracking pellets after a massive spill near Corpus Christi. It is the weirdest name you've ever heard, but it's a big problem. Right, I think that's what draws a lot of people to it, is they think, nurdle, I've never heard of a nurdle, you know, what is that? And then you get into talking about, well, it's plastic and it shouldn't be in the environment. We know for a fact that there's a laundry list of over 200 species that are eating these pellets. And then there's also a concern about what these pellets, once they're in the environment, they're absorbing uh, PCBs, PAHs, DDTs, you know, all those acronyms we hear about, harmful chemicals. These absorb those chemicals. Accumulating on our beaches, in our waterways as we speak. Exactly. The hot spot over here. Yeah. It's estimated as much as 250,000 tons of nurdles enter the ocean each year. We can tell based on the colors of the period of time they've been out in the sun. This has been happening over many decades. In North America, the problem is worst in the Gulf. This is really painting us a picture of where the highest concentrations are. All the way from Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula to the Florida Keys. Diane Wilson began collecting pellets on the waterways she used to fish, meticulously documenting where and when they were found. And now her work, 30 plastic tubs filled with evidence, has led to a record-breaking settlement. Formosa Plastics agreed to pay $50 million to help local fishermen and environmental cleanup projects in the area. When you first heard that Formosa was going to settle, what did you think? I was just kind of, I was in kind of state of shock about it. One million of that $50 million settlement will go to fund Tunnel's Nurdle Patrol. This isn't just one company that is the bad actor here. It's probably industry-wide based on the data that we've accumulated through Nurdle Patrol. Do you think the company or companies who are responsible for doing this are committed to fixing it. I don't think that these companies want their pellets out into the environment. I, I think that it is cheaper to leave the product on the ground after it's spilled than it is to clean it up. They don't want to spend the money to clean it up. Right. How do you make them do that? Regulations. Both Tunnel and Diane Wilson say the Formosa settlement is not the end of their fight. In fact, just the opposite. Every accessible point in the Gulf of Mexico has been sampled. Tunnel gets new reports of pellets washing ashore every day. There are currently 46 companies in Texas alone manufacturing plastics. 
and Tunnel's map showing the size of the problem is only growing. Do you feel like people are getting the message about this? Well, when I give presentations, one of the key points that I make is, um, you know, why are we doing all this? So I have a picture of my kids holding up a bottle of plastic pellets, and I tell people, this is for the next generation. You know, they shouldn't have to deal with this. They should be picking up seashells, not picking up plastic pellets off the beach. Now we take you to Antarctica, where scientists say man-made climate change is threatening the survival of penguins. Our correspondent Roxana Saberi traveled three days by ship from Argentina to Elephant Island for a first-hand look. Antarctica is one of the most remote places on the planet, but climate change is hitting it hard. We're here with a group of scientists who want to know how the warming weather is affecting this particular species of penguin, the chin strap. Elephant Island is so far flung, few people have set foot on these rocky shores. It took us three days of sailing with environmental activists from Greenpeace, crashing through waves and climbing across rubber rafts to join scientists counting penguins. Why count penguins? They come back to the same place to nest every year, which means we can really keep tabs on their populations. So by observing penguins, we can get an idea of the health of this, this whole area. Alex Borowitz observes nesting areas like this, where one parent babysits while another travels down a penguin highway to fish for krill, then hikes back up to feed its chick the shrimp-like food. You'll start down here. These scientists from Stony Brook and Northeastern Universities count each chaotic colony on foot with mechanical clickers and scan them from above with high-tech drones. All to see if this population of chinstrap penguins is dwindling, like elsewhere in the region. The researchers are traveling on Greenpeace ships from island to island across the Antarctic Peninsula. They're comparing different penguin populations to see how they're adapting to climate change here. It may not look like it, but this is one of the fastest warming areas on Earth. One nearby island is actually called Penguin Island. Over the past four decades, its chinstrap population has plunged by 75%. The numbers have dropped across the region as temperatures have soared by more than five degrees over 50 years. That's about five times the global average. So when we see climate change impacting things down here, glacial melt, uh, warming oceans, more acidic oceans, Penguins do really interact with, with all of those things. So do krill, chinstrap's favorite food. They depend on sea ice to survive. Sea ice is really what, what brings all of the, the ocean life here together. So with less sea ice, there's less krill, so less food for the chinstrap penguin? That's the idea. After days of counting chinstraps on Elephant Island, 21, 22, 22. The scientists invited us onto their ship 32 across. to watch them crunch numbers 30, from one nesting 31. site. Okay, so they've lost already 50% since the early teens. Wow. That's amazing. That fits the pattern they're seeing on the island so far, a decline of around 150,000 chin straps since the last major survey 50 years ago. Another sign the researchers say this penguin population is collapsing across the region. It's very dramatic to have a wildlife population decline by 50%, an unexploited wildlife population. They're not hunted. And you think climate change is the main reason behind it? I think climate change is driving almost all of the processes down here now in a way that they've never experienced before. Penguins are a lot like people. They need food and a good environment to thrive. These researchers say if the world continues to warm, these birds can show us how other species, even human beings, will be affected by climate change. Last year, we traveled to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, where scientists are trying to figure out why massive waves of seaweed are washing up on beaches. Researchers say it's proving to be an ecological and economical problem with no end in sight. It is the biggest algae bloom in the world. Massive waves of seaweed called sargassum washing up on shore day after day. This beach was just cleaned today. Yes. 
a couple of hours and the seaweed will be on the beach again. Jose Escalante has owned a small hotel in Tulum, Mexico for eight years. Every day, workers here and up and down the Yucatan Peninsula remove tons and tons of decomposing sargassum from beaches. Every night, it comes back. Rosa Rodriguez Martinez from Mexico's National University is trying to figure out why. We are getting sargassum almost from March to October. So basically more than half of the year we receive massive amounts. Whereas before it was how long? Before maybe two or three weeks during the summer. That's a huge difference. Yes, it's impressive. Uh, impressive is one word for it. A, a problem, a big problem is another. It's a problem, a economical problem, ecological and probably human health problem also. Since 2011, the amount of sargassum in the Atlantic has increased dramatically. It currently forms a 5,000 mile mass from Africa to the Caribbean. It is estimated to weigh 22 million tons. Why is it so bad right now? I think it's because we have polluted the sea too much. So now we have a lot of nutrients and the algae are taking advantage of it. Fertilizer runoff from Brazil increased by deforestation is believed to be the largest fuel source for the sargassum. That combined with warming ocean water and changing ocean currents has put the Yucatan squarely in the crosshairs. It has gotten so bad the Mexican Navy has just been put in charge of dealing with this problem. They took us up on a reconnaissance mission to locate the largest sargassum waves. We're fully aware that we're only addressing the effects of sargassum. Rear Admiral Enrique Flores Morado told us the Navy will build new sargassum busting ships to reel in as much as they can. But that does not solve any problem. In reality, the causes have to be addressed. But given the lack of research, we're now implementing immediate actions. Right now, many towns and resort owners are using floating barriers to corral and collect sargassum, including in Puerto Morelos, half an hour south of Cancun. We can say for sure that we are the first destination in the whole Mexican Caribbean with already a control above the sargassum. There's a lot of it though. Yeah, yeah, because this area, we are... It doesn't look controlled. No, no. Hector Tamayo is in charge of tourism here. How many trucks go in and out each day? It's more than 50. More than 50 trucks, yeah. just of sargassum every yeah. day, carted in and out yeah. here. And then we just start mixing that with the sargasso. Some are developing novel ways to use sargassum, including Omar Vasquez, who's building homes with it. They're better than the other bricks. The sargassum is mixed with clay and compost by foot and then compressed into bricks. I mean, it's ironic because I grew up without a house, without a home. Uh, we crossed the border to the States when I was eight years old. And then came back. I came back to live my Mexican dream. Your Mexican dream? Yes. It doesn't have not even a gram of cement. Everything is organic. Even though Vasquez says his homes are 100% organic, there may be an issue with what accumulates in the sargassum at sea. We took it fresh. Rosa Rodriguez's latest research shows sargassum is high in heavy metals like lead and arsenic. And disposal is a major issue. This is one of the places we found where the sargassum is taken. It's a dump site miles into the jungle, far away from the ocean. It's unclear if the sargassum left here seeps into the ground, goes up into the air, or just sits here forever. Sargassum is either being dumped inland or buried under the beach, which is illegal. It is a crisis stretching across the Caribbean with no end in sight. For folks watching this who may not be familiar with this problem or what's happening here, what do you say? It's something that is happening to the world, not, not just to the region. This is just a consequence of the entire planet being, you know, in, in trouble. Researchers say an estimated 150 million people live on land that will be below the high tide line 30 years from now. Brooke Silva Braga takes us to Norfolk, Virginia, where citizens are coming together with a unique effort to protect their community from rising seas. The water comes up from Collie Bay into the street. You see it just flowing right it's now. Flowing it's flowing right, right into your yard. Yep. And as the tide rose, the water kept creeping toward Here John Blumming's go. house, which now sits on stilts. And, uh, After I bought the house, I realized it was a common occurrence. 
after you bought the after house. After I bought the house. Uh, how much of a financial surprise was that? Uh, about uh, $90,000 to lift it up. Low-lying Norfolk has always faced flooding from hurricanes, like Isabel back in 2003. But what we saw in John's front yard is something different. Uh, when the tide comes up, we get a little flooding. Seawater brought to land by nothing more than a high tide. It could be a sunny day like today. Sharon and Bean lives by the water here too. She told us the house can still get flood insurance. They just had to cut power to the outlets on the ground floor. I think it's worse in the fall. Then she showed us videos of kayakers paddling down her street and her dog, Han Solo, floating in space above the same wall where we were sitting. And in a year, that happens how many times? Oh, I would say maybe 26. 26 times? Yes. It's up here all the time. It's a lot. The U.S. government says globally, the sea level has risen more than three inches in just the last 25 years. And because of things like erosion and ocean currents, some places have faced more rise than others. Norfolk has evidence of that, thanks to a tidal gauge dating back to 1927. Since Sewell's Point gauge in the city of Norfolk was installed there near the naval base, it's raised by nearly a foot and a half. Since Derek Loftus, a researcher from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, says that foot and a half of change comes not just from the water rising, but also because overdevelopment of Norfolk's marshy soil has been sinking the land. We think this will get worse, or we don't really know. By the year 2050, I mean, we're kind of expecting an increase of somewhere between 0.7 to one foot of water. Another foot higher. Yeah. You say that so calmly. Oh, yeah, we've been researching it for years, so I feel like I've known this for a while, but. But resignation in Norfolk may be as common as water in the streets. You can see it's the continuation of a sidewalk. At least that's how it felt to Dave Mayfield three uh, years uh, ago as he wrapped up a career as an environmental journalist for the local paper. I was feeling a bit depressed. We're seeing flooding more and more. Uh, people are being inconvenienced. And yet nothing happens. Yeah, and yet nothing happens. I wanted to do something that uh, might make a difference, you know, at least in helping engage people. So Mayfield got an idea. Virginia's he knew each the fall the alignment of the moon, earth, and sun cause what's known as a king tide. In otherwise normal high tide, that's especially strong and more importantly, predictable. We would get as many people as possible out on one day to measure an unusually high tide, have their data crowdsourced into a model improving flood forecasting. He partnered with a group that had developed a tide mapping app and dubbed the event Catch the King. To his surprise, more than 700 people turned out. We've got high tide in about 30 minutes. Guinness certified it as the world's largest ever environmental survey. I think what I underestimated was the innate desire of people to be part of something larger that might result in something good. There have now been three annual Catch the King events, and the idea has inundated other parts of the calendar. If the tide charts call for flooding in coastal Virginia, you'll probably find a mapper at the high water mark. So what we do is we walk along the water line at high tide, and about every five feet, we press a button, and that records our exact location on the GPS. And here's what I've done today. That, that's the outline of the water? Yes, every place that I have stopped and, and uh, pushed the app. Mappers like Bill Weary have now pushed the app tens of thousands of times. Yeah, I'm going to take a look at the data that's coming in there. Okay. Their yeah, readings the end up in the hands of researchers, like Derek Loftus tells us whether our model's right or wrong, which scientists live and die by. Also, what's particularly useful is it helps us find areas for potential improvement. For example, most of the flooding you'll see today is due to storm drainage systems. And as Mayfield hoped, more than anything, it's given ordinary people a way to do something about a problem no one person can do much about. Although we can't stop the tides, eventually some sort of uh, Preventative uh, action uh, is going to be, well, it is needed. And the more and more data that the scientists have, I think the better we'll be able to, to uh, prevent the tide uh, from causing harm to the neighborhood. Uh, may it all come out of uh, what we're doing. The unusually high tide that we might see on our annual project day for Catch the King is going to be a routine high tide not many decades from now. 
So we provide, I think, a window into the future. More than 25 years ago, the Northwest Forest Plan was put in place to protect more than 24 million acres of forest in the Pacific Northwest. But the debate over who's in charge of America's ancient forests is under scrutiny. November 2122 two, Sierra, runway 2, clear for takeoff. Our trip began in a small plane, maybe the best way to see what's happening in western Oregon. You can see where there's a few trees left here and there that's required by Oregon law. Our guide, Chandra Legui of the group Oregon Wild. So we're actually really in the heart of some serious logging right now. The views from overhead can be jarring. Mountains teeming with towering trees, followed by winding cutouts of nothing but stumps. This is what modern day clear cutting looks like. Giant machines handle massive trees like matchsticks. This land has never been logged. No, it hasn't. This is a place where none of that has happened. A so-called old growth forest. We only have about 15% of the forest that once grew trees like this that are left. Areas like this were protected by the Northwest Forest Plan, which was signed in 1994 and impacted more than 24 million acres of federal land in Oregon, California, and Washington. Was the Northwest Forest Plan a success or failure? From an environmental perspective, it's a success, but um, we're only 25 years in. It's kind of a long-term experiment. Logging on federal lands has dropped by as much as 90%, but on state-owned and private land, time-lapse of satellite images over Northwest Oregon give a sense of just how common clear-cutting still is. Legui says it has a lasting impact. Forests capture carbon, helping to cool the earth and slow climate change. Logging companies are required by law to replant new trees after clear cuts. But it can take a decade or more before a young forest absorbs as much carbon as an old one. Not every company like yours is willing to talk about their story or take us to places like this. Why, why do you do that? I think we as an industry have not done a very good job historically of telling our story. Todd Payne yeah, is the really CEO of Seneca Jones, a timber giant in Western Oregon. Has the Northwest Forest Plan been a success or failure in your estimation? Honestly speaking, I think it's, it was a failure. Payne believes the Northwest Forest Plan is choking growth and the hands-off approach environmentalists advocate is leading to more wildfires because forests have been neglected. He took us to one of Seneca's expansive tree farms an hour and a half outside Eugene, where they operate on 50-year cycles. This area next to us was clear-cut about 55 years ago for the first time, and then clear-cut again three or four years ago. Three years ago, correct. Why clear-cut? We're mimicking what uh, Mother Nature's done for, for billions of years. But this looks traumatic for a lot of people when they see something like this. Um, I actually look at it quite different. I think it's, uh, it's somewhat aesthetically pleasing. You think that looks aesthetically pleasing? I do. And maybe it's uh, somewhat biased, but uh, uh, I look at this and, and I, I see sustainability, rejuvenation. Timber companies have also traditionally used a practice called aerial spraying. Chemicals drop via helicopter to kill any vegetation other than trees used for lumber. A lot of people are concerned about the spraying. Well, I think people are just not informed well on that subject. Um, we use it once or twice in a 50-year cycle. It ultimately flows somewhere, though. No, it doesn't. You know, a lot of times, this stuff doesn't flow off the landscape. The product will adhere to the vegetation that it's targeted for and stay there. Nancy Webster, who lives up the coast in Rockaway Beach, Oregon, is worried those chemicals seep into her drinking water. The fight between environmentalists and, and logging companies is not new, but this seems like the newest chapter. Right, this affects the fish, the wildlife, and we are up against large corporations. And to even counter it, you know, you need science and legal help, and it's, it's really difficult for small communities. Today, the situation may be reaching a critical point because the federal government wants to suspend a public review process, which logging companies say needlessly ties them up in court. Should there be a public review process when logging takes place on public lands? Well, we have professionals in place in, in our federal agencies that are managing these lands, and I think we need to let them do that work. 
In other words, he wants groups like Oregon Wild to stay away. The argument is from them that if they're not able to, to log, people can't build homes. Yeah, well, no one's talking about shutting down logging. We're talking about what I feel are common sense changes that do less damage to the environment that we all share. Legui wants to see forests thin, not clear cut, a far less invasive approach. Though she acknowledges it is more expensive and would produce less lumber. I think people do need to come to grips with the fact that the wood that they use to build houses or anything else comes from clear cutting forests in places like Oregon. So you, what you're saying is there's a price to pay for a better world. I think in order to make amends in some way, that there is a price to pay for that. And I think it's worth it. You can find news and more stories like this on CBS This Morning from 7 to 9 a.m. And you can find news 24-7 right here on CBSN featuring live anchored coverage available for free across all platforms. Thanks for joining us. Take care of each other.